All right. So good afternoon. I just want to thank you all for coming to our last, this is our last installment of our entrepreneur speaker series this semester. Um, but don't worry, because we will be starting to back up for next semester. But this is our last one. I'm Shanika Turner. I am an assistant professor here at Georgia Highlands College, and I will be the moderator for today. In the spring of 2021, we will launch an associate's degree in entrepreneurship. With this degree, students will learn the basics of entrepreneurship, small business ventures, and business plan development. Students will develop knowledge, skills, and values from direct experiences outside of the traditional academic setting through exponential learning. And this speaker series is just an example of one of the exponential learning um, that they will actually experience. Enrollment is actually currently open for the entrepreneurship pathway. So those that are interested, you are um, able to enroll now. Um, to make sure we stay on schedule, you will notice that you are muted. But at any time, please type in any questions that you may have into the chat box. And I will definitely fill those questions right after our speaker is finished. And I hope you guys ask lots of questions because that's what he's here for, to help you out and answer those questions. And today I am honored to introduce our guest speaker, Brandon Hurst, a native of Atlanta, Georgia. Brandon Hurst started his Chick-fil-A career while receiving his undergraduate degree from Alabama State University. He graduated magnum cum laude with a degree in accounting in 2010. During his tenure at ASU, Hurst participated in several student organizations, including serving as a treasurer for the Beta Upsilon Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Immediately after graduating from ASU, Hurst accepted a director of operations role in Chicago, Illinois, a new emerging market for Chick-fil-A brand. He completed his MBA in finance in 2012 and joined Chick-fil-A's leadership de de development program in Atlanta, Georgia, where he was responsible for partnering with franchise owners across the United States to launch successful franchises. Having garnered so much experience and exposure from quick service restaurant industry, he decided to pursue his own entrepreneurship endeavors. In October of 2014, Hearst, at the age of 26, was selected to become a Chick-fil-A franchise owner, operating his first location in Baltimore, Maryland, the Chick-fil-A's first, the city's first downtown um, location in, in April of 2015. Today, Brandon is the owner of the first Chick-fil-A in Brooklyn, New York, located right across from the Barclays Center. With over 12 years of experience in the hospitality and restaurant industry, Hearst is passionate about serving others, not only in the restaurant, but within the community. He's been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Outstanding Community Service. He's traveled across the country speaking at local colleges and universities and other community organizations, often sharing his life journey and the importance of focusing on community service, advancement of youth education, financial responsibility, and building tomorrow's leaders. We are so very honored and excited to have Brandon Hurst as our speaker today. Brandon, the virtual floor is yours. Awesome. Well, Shanika, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor. It's a pleasure uh, to be joining you guys today. Um, I'm super excited to just kind of share my story, um, my journey uh, of about entrepreneurship and, and just matriculating through and with Chick-fil-A. Um, and so, as you said, I'm originally from Atlanta. Uh, it's funny, you and I went to high school together. Um, and so, I was born to a single parent home. The funny thing about my story is that um, I knew nothing about Chick-fil-A growing up. Um, I, I never went inside of a restaurant. I would literally uh, be sitting in the stands after a football game and eating a chicken sandwich, never connecting the dots of like, man, this is a chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A. Uh, to be honest with you, the Chick-fil-A was just always too expensive for my family. I grew up in a low middle-class family and so, uh, the, a, a trip to the local McDonald's was a treat for us. And so um, 
my, when I was born, my mom was diagnosed with congestive heart failure and she was actually told that she only had a couple of years to live. Uh, and so gratefully, she was able to, to live until I turned the age of 12. Um, and so at that time, my older brother and I uh, got adopted by my aunt, who I now call my mom. And so I, I always remember having such a strong entrepreneurial spirit. Um, what I mean by that is my mom was disabled, so we were always looking for different type of ways to bring additional income into the household. Um, she was very good with numbers. I can remember or recall times sitting in the living room watching her do taxes for people in the community or just the family. She was our, our family accountant. Um, and so I remember a, I recall a specific incident where uh, my mom had this huge jar of dill pickles. And I don't know what happened that particular day, but something just told me to say, hey, sell those to your, your friends in the neighborhood. And that's exactly what I did. So my mom comes home one day um, and she's like, Brandon, what happened to my jar of pickles? And I'm talking about these are the fat, juicy dill pickles. Um, and, and I was like, well, mom, I, I sold them to the kids in the neighborhood. And she was like, you did what? And I said, I, I sold them to the kids in the neighborhood, to my friends. And she said, well, how much did you sell those for? And I said, well, I sold them for 50 cents. And next thing I know, she said, oh, man, as big as those pickles were, you could at least sold them for a dollar. And so all I remember is chasing my friends down the street uh, that particular day saying, hey, my mom said you owe me 50 cents more. And so what that did was that actually sparked the idea for us to become the neighborhood candy lady or the candy house. Um, and so I remember I had this like piggy bank. We ended up breaking it open, pulling all together to change. And we went to the local Cub Foods at the time, um, bought all of the candy bars that we could and, and just started selling. And curiosity is, is what struck me. So I had this green, hard shell Ninja Turtles lunchbox. And I remember every day before I left for school, I would take like blow pops and Jolly Ranchers and stick them in that lunchbox and I would sell it. Um, and so that idea grew to by the time I graduated high school, I had two people working for me and I was doing over $300 a day in sales. I literally was the walking vending machine. Um, I had five five bags, uh, one bag full of books, and the other four bags were just full of like junk food, snack foods. There was nothing that you could not get from me that you got out of the vending machine. And so again, I, I was very driven. I've been working uh, since the age of 10. Um, and, and quite honestly, again, I, I think that spirit just grew out of how do I I got tired of being told, no, hey, we can't afford this. And so I, I was looking to solve an issue. And that issue was, how do I afford the things that I necessarily wanted and or needed? Um, and so fast forward, like I said, unfortunately, I lost my mom at the age of 12, got adopted by my, who I now call my mom. And so that just drastically changed a lot of different things. Ended up moving from the city of Atlanta out to Clayton County, which is where I, I, I finished the, my eighth grade year and then started to matriculate through high school at Riverdale High School. Um, I was always academically smart, um, never really was a, a, a huge sports guy, but my outlets was all of the academia from SGA, mock trial, uh, student body president, all of those different things. And so we hit another fork in the road to where eventually both my aunt and uncle unfortunately lost their jobs. Um, and so we ended up losing our, we ended up losing our home out in the county and had to move back to the city. Well, at that particular time, I had already made a name for myself um, and, and just was really plugged in into the Clayton County Riverdale community. And so my parents at the time, they gave me an option. They said, hey, you can transfer schools in, in the middle of your junior year. Um, or you figure out a way to get back and forth to school. And so at that particular time, it's like, no, I, I'm going to stay here at Riverdale. And so I ended up having to catch the public transportation, MARTA, two hours each way. Um, and I, I did that all the way through graduation. 
And so my very first uh, official job was I worked at a movie theater and then left that and went on to working at Crystal's. And so at a very early age, got bit by the, the fast food bug, as, as you will. And so I remember I would get up sometimes at 4 a.m. in the morning, get on the bus, catch the train all the way to the last stop, which at the time was the Atlanta airport. Uh, catch another bus from there, get off at the top of the hill, walk down to school, all still while having uh, maintaining a 4.0 GPA, still keeping up with my band studies and my other extracurricular activities. I would leave, get out of school at 3.30, do my extracurricular activities, go to work at six o'clock um, at the local crystals on Old National. Uh, sometimes I would do six to 10, got off of work from there and had to make that two hour commute back to the city of Atlanta. And so did this all the way through high school and how I got to Alabama State. At the particular time, um, when it came down to going to and applying to college, I never went on any college tours. My aspirations have always been go to law school, complete law school, go work on Wall Street in New York. I've always been infatuated with working um, in New York. I thought I was going to be some big corporate tax attorney um, to marry my love for law and business. And so I applied to over 14 different colleges and universities. And out of 14, 12 of those schools were all out of state. I didn't care where I went. It was a, just a matter of, I did not want to stay in Georgia. I just wanted to get away, go and explore what else was out there. And so um, the day before graduation, I ended up getting a letter in the mail from Alabama State University. And they said, uh, hey, Brandon, we want to offer you a presidential scholarship. And the funny thing about it is I, I even forgot that I applied uh, to Alabama State. Um, but man, in hindsight, I, I'm glad that I did because it was one of the best decisions that I ever could have made. Um, and so there you have it. The day before graduation, I ended up accepting that offer letter from Alabama State University. Um, without visiting the campus, all I knew at the time was they were offering the most money. And I said, that's where I'm going. And I remember getting ready to drive down and relocate to Montgomery, Alabama. I'm driving across the state line, literally watching the temperature rise. And I said, man, what did I just get myself into? Uh, and so ended up getting down there. I went with a group of friends um, and originally was not going to get in, be a part of the band because I realized how much time that band would take up, especially going to an HBCU. Uh, you really dedicated a lot of time because they were they were performers and I and I understood that and my my direction was to go to law school and I felt like man I didn't want to be distracted and so ended up being persuaded by a group of friends getting in the band loved it became a drum major my sophomore year um, and and really just started to matriculate from there so when I think about just those early stages of leadership they were planted at a very early age for me um, and I just continued to carry that through college. And so at the same time, I also transferred my job from Crystal's on, on National to working at Crystal's in Alabama. Uh, ended up leaving there and went to McDonald's, was there for about a year, and then went to Taco Bell, where I became the overnight supervisor. And so I kind of began to earn a name for myself, or, or people knew, like, man, Brandon, wherever he went, he always ended up getting a, a, a management position at these particular jobs and had no aspirations of building a career out of quick service. And so about 2008, I get approached from one of my frat brothers and saying, hey, Brandon, there's a Chick-fil-A up the street that I think you would be a really good fit for. They're hiring for a marketing director role. I think you should go and apply. And I'm literally looking at him like, dude, I'm trying to go to law school and I really don't think I can build a career out of working at quick service. And he was like, all right, man, I, I hear you, but you really should take a, a deeper look into Chick-fil-A. And so eventually I gave into the peer pressure again and um, went and applied, did not get the marketing director role. But what that owner operator saw in me at that particular time was, hey, you have a lot of operational experience and we could use you uh, within the restaurants to help us with our team. But oh, by the way, we don't hire leaders externally. So if a leadership position is what you would be looking for, then we would ask that you join our team as a team member and work your way through there. And I, and I found that I found that challenge very interesting because again, I was already accustomed to just walking into the other quick service industries or restaurants saying, hey, 
here's my resume, here's my experience. Do you guys have any leadership opportunities available? And so naturally, I'm a type of person that loves challenges. And so I accepted the position and really wasn't sold on the idea. So I ended up keeping both jobs for a period of time. I literally would go to work at 10 p.m. at the Taco Bell across the street, get off at 6 a.m., run across the street, um, and open up at the Chick-fil-A at 6.30 in the morning. And I did that for a period of about three to four months because honestly, I just didn't know where it was going to land with the Chick-fil-A. But again, I, I'm glad that I took that route because, man, it was a game changer for me. And I still, mind you, did all of this while I was a drum major in the band, still doing all of my different school activities. Um, and so there was a pattern that just continued. And so fast forward, I had an opportunity to meet Dan Cathy, who is now our president um, and CEO. And so I met him at a leadership conference and I'm sitting on front row, just literally in tears. Um, I, I felt convicted, convicted in a way of this whole entire time he's talking about leadership and the definition of what servant leadership was all about. And that conviction that I was feeling was like, man, I have this definition of leadership all wrong. And so I remember leaving that conference, fired up, went back to my operator, and I said, hey, tell me a little bit more about Chick-fil-A. And now I'm starting to really get into some of my core curriculum in the business program at Alabama State. And so things just started aligning. Um, I would go into work and my operator would say, hey, Brandon, I want you to be responsible for inventory. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm just learning this in production management class. And so after that, my operator says, hey, I want you to start traveling um, and, and doing some grand openings. And so from that point, I started meeting other individuals. And what that did was that opened my eyes up to see possibilities beyond just the four walls of the restaurant. Because I, I'll be honest, again, most people, when they think about approaching quick service type opportunities, they, they think about, hey, these are starter opportunities. I'm not necessarily sure how long the runway is for career building. And so I started doing grand openings. And on one particular opening, I ended up meeting who now, well, a gentleman who I now call one of my mentors, a very successful uh, operator out in the Maryland, D.C. area. And so he tapped into me and said, hey, Brandon, like, I really think you have a knack for Chick-fil-A and what it is that you do. It seems like you're very happy um, and you get good results uh, out of it. Maybe you should look at this as career opportunities. And so he started telling me a little bit more about his role and what he did with Chick-fil-A in terms of partnering and supporting franchise owners across the countries. And at the time, the light bulb still hadn't clicked in terms of pursuing my own entrepreneur opportunities. And so... Um, I get an opportunity to go serve in Chicago. Chicago was a brand new market. This was around 2010 when we opened the very first location there. And so I get up there, fall in love with Chicago again. That's my affinity for big cities coming from Atlanta. And I get back to campus and my freshman professor, I'm walking across the yard and she says, hey, Brandon, you've been on my mind a lot lately. And she said, she reaches in her purse, she hands me this book by Dr. Ben Carson, and it's called Take the Risk. And as I'm reading this book, one of the messages that profoundly stands out to me is, oftentimes when we are assessing the risk, we think about what's the worst that can happen versus what's the best that can happen. And at this particular time, I was contemplating, do I stay on the course to go to law school? Do I stay here at Alabama State because they just approached me to offer a free master's program in accounting, or do I pursue this opportunity to chase this newfound love with Chick-fil-A? And after reading that book, I felt like, man, I, I, I have my answer. And I, I was so in love with the possibilities with Chick-fil-A. And so turned down the free master's, put a pause on going to law school, and two weeks after graduating undergrad, I drove 14 hours straight to start a brand new life and career in Chicago, not knowing what was actually going to be at the end of the, of the rainbow, not knowing what type of career opportunities I was chasing. But what I did realize was in that moment of assessing risk, I, I took a chance and I bet it on myself. I bet it that I knew how confident that I was and how young that no matter what the amount of mistakes that I made, I could always go back and pick up the pick up where I left off. 
Um, and so that really gave me the courage to make the decision to go to Chicago and, and, and take that chance. And I spent about two years in the Chicago market, still ended up completing my MBA. Um, and while I was there, man, when I tell you Chicago experience was the worst, best case scenario, uh, the worst because it, it taught me so much about building relationships with people that I really didn't know. And here I am being the only one that's knowledgeable in a brand new city trying to expand this brand and introduce people to the Chick-fil-A brand in the Midwest um, as a Southern company. And the, the greatest and best experience, because I learned so much about myself in terms of leadership and, and building teams. And there did come a point where I wanted to wave the white flag. Uh, there were so many times where I wanted to walk away and I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I remember uh, one day I picked up the phone and I called one of my mentors at the home office and I said, hey, I really think that I'm about to walk away from the quick service industry. Um, I, I don't see... I don't see where this is growing and I don't see a path. And I said, do you guys have any opportunities for me to come back to Atlanta, join a corporate team, maybe in an accounting or a finance capacity? And I said, I, I had it all mapped out. And so he said, yeah. So Chick-fil-A ended up flying me down. I interviewed for an accounting position. By the time I got done, they said, no, we don't see you sitting at a desk crunching numbers. We actually think that you would be bored with that. Um, with that type of opportunity and career. So they walked me down the hall and said, hey, there's an awesome opportunity. We're getting ready to start and launch a brand new leadership development program. Um, and as you explained, or as was mentioned earlier, this was an opportunity for me to travel across the country, partner with franchise owners and help them launch their business. And so at that particular time, I had about a semester left to complete my MBA. I ended up completing my MBA and in 2012, in the spring of 2012, I ended up joining Chick-fil-A Corporate um, as a supervisor in which I traveled across the country and hiring training team members to help launch and partner with franchise owners to launch their businesses across the country. And, and that, was a, that was a 30 month commitment. And that afforded me the opportunity to partner with other business leaders that were coming from all different various industries um, and I gave me a, an opportunity to learn firsthand experience, how they thought about business and what inspired them to start in their entrepreneurs endeavors. And I remember about eight months into the program, the light bulb finally went off for me. I started having other individuals around me like, Brandon, man, you're really good at this. Have you ever thought about the franchise opportunities? And, and at the same time, I still have blinders on. It's like, no. I think I'm gonna climb the corporate ladder. That's, I mean, think about it. That's exactly oftentimes what most business schools think about or, or, or teach you. Not, it's very rare where you come across really good entrepreneurship programs. Um, and so after I started, after a few people started planting more seeds, like the light bulb went off. I remember getting a call, I was driving down the highway and my boss calls me and says, hey, Brandon, do you realize that Chick-fil-A is, is eventually gonna expand into New York? Like when I tell you, everyone knew my infatuation uh, with New York, had never been, had never visited. All I can remember was just things. I, I was a dreamer. Um, and so I, re I remember being too excited. I had to pull over on the side of the road and said, like, God, is this you saying I still get an opportunity to go to New York? I just won't be practicing law. I'll, I'll probably be selling lots of chicken sandwiches. Um, and so I, I remember only requesting East Coast assignments. And at that moment, when I saw that eventually Chick-fil-A would be expanding into the New York and Northeast market, I got laser focused. I started requesting on the East Coast assignments. I would drive every weekend. I ended up joining the uh, Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, uh, not even knowing if New York was gonna be the final destination for me. But all I knew was that, hey, there was something that I had to prove to myself. Um, there was a proven concept and I wanted to learn, I wanted to research, I wanted to learn what New Yorkers thought um, and how they would perceive quick service and let alone a Southern company. Um, I remember standing out in Bryant Park off 42nd Street, um, literally conducting my own surveys, customer surveys, just trying to get an understanding of consumer behavior and what they thought about eating at quick service restaurants. And Eventually, I entered, I decided to say, you know what, I'm going to go all in. And so I submitted my name. I, I changed paths and said, hey, I don't think I'm going to pursue the corporate route, but I, I really am going to 
consider becoming a franchise owner. And so submitted my name in the process, which is a very, very competitive process. And in 2014, at the age of 26, I was selected for Baltimore. Um, funny story of how I got to Baltimore. At the particular time, in the leadership development program, you, there's a time limit that you have to serve. And at the time that I was coming up on my, hitting my, my limit, we just couldn't secure real estate soon enough. Um, and so that's actually how I ended up in Baltimore. And in hindsight, I am forever grateful uh, for the experience. I spent about five years uh, in the Baltimore market, again, at the age of 26, and really getting my feet wet into this whole entrepreneur spirit and just really trying to understand. There were several mistakes that I made. There were a lot of wins, a lot of ups and a lot of downs that I experienced. Um, but I, I, I knew who I was and I knew who I wanted to be and I definitely knew where I was going. What I realized and what I came to understand was I was chasing a, a bigger purpose. It wasn't about just selling Chick-fil-A sandwiches or delicious milkshakes and waffle fries. It was more about offering opportunities to go into environments, urban environments, in which I would be able to employ individuals who look like me and, and offer opportunities and open doors for them um, who would share similar walks of life um, and that I could recall when I grew up in, a, in the city of Atlanta. And there are not many locations that are in downtown, urban, highly populated density areas. Uh, our, our brand just wasn't built that way. We were, we're typically the suburban type restaurants. And I knew that one, this would, if, if I could position a pitch to where going into urban areas would open the doors for us to go international, that excited me because that was opportunity. Um, and I knew that there was so much pent up demand in, in, in downtown areas that we wanted Chick-fil-A as well. Um, and so I was very passionate about that. And that's actually how I ended up in Baltimore. Um, and how I came to Brooklyn, wow. Um, there were several, several opportunities open up in the city of Manhattan. And I think God knew the right time and the right place and the right location for me, because I actually thought that Brooklyn was going to be further down a location. And so in 2018, I get a call uh, from real estate and they say, hey, we think we found a really good location in Brooklyn. Um, and so I remember hopping on the train, came up to Brooklyn, and as you're coming up the train or as you're coming off the stop and you look over to the right, you have the Barclays Center right there in front of you and right there, I, I saw this location. It's newly constructed, boarded up, and I said, this is it. Something just felt right. Um, and I remember crossing the street, praying over the location, and I said, hey, God, is this, if this is where you want me to be, then this is where I want to be, and this is where I will go. Um, and so in 2018, uh, got the call to say, hey, we want you to go and open the first store in, in Brooklyn, New York. And so after going through tons of uh, new construction pushbacks, we finally opened the doors to my new location here in Brooklyn in September of 2019. And so we just hit our one year mark um, two months ago. And it's, it's been such a journey. Uh, when I talk about being stretched in this season is, is, forcing me to lead from a, a higher level. It's, it's, it's really forcing me to level up. And it, I'm excited about every twist and turn and every single individual that I get to impact. My team has since doubled. I now lead an organization of 100 plus team members. Um, and I have a, a leadership staff of, of just under 20. And I'm still looking to grow that as I think about going multi-unit and growing the business and introducing the brand here um, in the Brooklyn area. And so that has really been my Chick-fil-A journey and several things that I've learned along the way, just in terms of building teams. Leadership is essence, in, in, in its essence is purely about serving others. And how do you get people to motivate around a vision and motivate you? Um, people often say people don't want to go and work for a job, they wanna go and work for a person. And so that is one of the things that I've learned on my journey as a, as a Chick-fil-A entrepreneur is how do I create my own brand in which people just naturally want to follow me and rally behind a cause and our goals. Um, one of my personal missions is always to make sure that I'm creating a environment of growth, stability, and exposure to new life experiences. Um, and so 
if you get if you guys ever get an opportunity to visit my restaurant um you will see that woven throughout our culture um just how engaged my team and my leaders are because that's intentional that's how i am as a leader um it's not always just about the results but it's about the relationships and the impacts that we build and so that's been a part of my my chick-fil-a journey um i would love to open up the the floor for for questions Yes, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, I have a, a question for you, Brandon. Uh, what advice do you have for the students that are going to be entering into our new entrepreneurship program? What advice can you offer them? Very good, very good. Um, I would say, as I think about going into entrepreneurship, one of the things that I didn't realize as I was going through business school was the importance of just building a team around you. And I, I think in business school, you're gonna get the, the, the technical aspect of, here's how you put together business statements. Here's how you put together a business plan. Um, but what I've learned along the way is, in order for you to go and execute on all of those different things, you gotta be able to put together a solid, team around you um and being the capability of being able to put together a team is has everything to do about you and your leadership style than it does about just the skill set i also I, I often talk about this 80 20 concept and which is 20 percent about the skills and the work related to do the job but it's more more so about that 80 percent of, of character and relationship building um, because I realized I, I can't run a multi-million dollar entity without being able to have a very successful and engaged team around that. I, I think what I've encountered along the way is entrepreneurs who have a really good product, they have a really good marketing aspect, but they never spent any time trying to build a team around them. And, and that's so important as you think about leading and you don't have to be some John Maxwell or just like have that, that impact. What you do have to realize is a great deal of self-awareness about who you are and know how to hire in areas where you may not necessarily be full or where it's may not necessarily your strength. For me, I know that I'm a dreamer, I'm a visionary, but there are sometimes I tend to overlook the minor details and those minor details can tend to break or, or make a decision. And so because I realize about that, I, because I realize that about myself and as a leader, I know how to go and pinpoint and, and, and look for those leaders within my organizations that are very detail oriented. That's, that's awesome, awesome advice, awesome advice. Um, we have some questions in our chat box. Um, you mentioned one book, but what are some other books you suggest? <laughs> oh, um, several other books. Um, Leaders Eat Last, um, Chess Not Checkers, um, Soar by T.D. Jakes, um, The Path Made Clear by Oprah Winfrey. Um, that's, and, and, and I'm, and I'm a pause on those particular books because again, it, it kind of goes back to the last question about, Hey, what are some things that I would tell people about pursuing entrepreneurship? And what I would say about those particular books, the path made clear and soar it, those two books really helped me to understand purpose, right? I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs quite honestly, not be as successful as they would have hoped to have been because what they were chasing was some type of financial return. And for me, when I, when I started in the Chick-fil-A opportunity or the process to become a franchise owner, it wasn't about the money for me. It was about the, the, the product. It was about one, partnering with a brand that was tried, trusted, and true. Um, they had a really good product, but it was more about the impact that I could have um, on my individual team members and the opportunities that I could give to employ individuals, like I said, that had the same walk of life. I've, I've always kind of been placed in that situation where 
I'm either given some type of inspirational speech or my team members look up to me as a, a, a coach, a, sometimes a, a father figure. And when I realize there are many different umbrellas and hats that I get to wear within my organization. Um, and, and that's purpose. It's, it, it was about chasing purpose. The financial return, allow that to be the byproduct of you truly understanding your purpose. Because here's the thing, when you get into those tough times where the money isn't necessarily flowing in easily, or when you're having those tough, really hard days and you want to wave that white flag, when you're able to go back to your purpose and understand what that is, it, that, that's so empowering, um, more than anything that a, a monetary value could provide. And, and I, I think that's so important. I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, what are some things you do for professional and personal growth? Mm. Um, one of the things that I would think about, um, or one of the things that I would say that I'm always doing, one, I, I try to make sure that I'm not always the smartest person in the room. Um, and what I mean by that is I am always looking for opportunities to engage with people across other industries. Um, and to see what I can learn from them. It's, it's a two-way street. The thing about entrepreneurship, you have to make a commitment to be a student for life. There is, there is, not, there is no one out there that is either too young or too old for me to learn. And, and, and I think there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? So knowledge, I define as the acquisition of just information and, and skill set. But wisdom is your ability to be able to apply that knowledge in whatever it is that you're doing. And that's how I define the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And so I listen to podcasts, I read, um, even if it's for 30 minutes out of the day. I'm, I'm trying to constantly feed my mind. Um, and, and I just have this, this thing, like, how can I get better? Um, but the driving, the true driving force behind that is I realized that I lead people from every walk of life. And the moment that I stop growing, I indirectly put a cap and a lid on their ability to grow to the next level. So that is the driving force for me to say, hey, this is that personal development. Um, there, were, there was a time where I went a whole year, every month it was like leadership development or, or some type of leadership inspirational book. And I was like, all right, let's pause. Like, let's, let's, let's pick a different genre. Um, and so I remember I, I took about six months. I, I took a six month break from that because it was like, all right, you can sit here and read all of these different things, but how are you truly applying it? Um, I, I remember there was a time I, I joined Toastmaster during my earlier years when I was in Chicago. Um, I've encouraged other people. I'm constantly trying to connect with local business chambers. Uh, but I, I think that's key. It's really just out there building relationships and trying to understand, like, I don't know it all. And, and I, I want to make sure that I'm constantly feeding that, that thirst and that hunger uh, to just want to know more. It's a whole world out there. It's a whole world out there. And, and I alone don't have all the answers. Awesome. What advice do you have for someone who is wanting to open their own Chick-fil-A franchise? So I, I get, that's a million dollar question, man. If I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me that. Uh, I would first, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Understand your purpose. Don't get glamour, glamorized by, because it's just Chick-fil-A. Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is we are not immune to other industry pressures. Um, yes, most Chick-fil-A's are very successful, but you may have some restaurants that aren't as successful. When I think about, what some of my peers have been experienced through this COVID season. That's a perfect example of, hey, we're not immune to just other pressures. So one, understand and make sure that you want to get involved in the restaurant industry because it is very, very grimy. Um, and, and what I mean by that is it's a lot of hard work. Turnover is constantly high. Um, and I, I know it because I, I was guilty of having that mindset of, man, you can't build a career out of, out of quick service. You can, but it's not for everyone. 
you really have to understand that being in this industry is about hospitality and serving others. Um, I would encourage you before you even do your research online, reach out to local owners and operators, understand their stories. Don't just take my, my, my journey as, as the, the sole path. Um, because again, I've served and worked alongside many of brilliant minds out there that come from other various industries. Um, and then you can always start your search at chickfil.com uh, backslash franchisee opportunities and look at that um, and, and just understand. But before you, I, I think the biggest thing to, re to remember before you even embark upon that journey, make sure that you know what it feels like and know that you want to be a restaurant owner. It's, it's not just about Chick-fil-A. It's a good product. It's a great franchise model, but man, I, I would say it's like getting a huge, huge toolbox and then you have to determine how you build your house with all of the tools that's given to you because you don't have a map. There is no particular map in how you want to build your business. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's very important. Before I decided to make the final decision to join Chick-fil-A and pursue a franchise opportunity, I did my research. I looked at other brands. I wanted to make sure that I just, I, I wasn't blindsided and or that I, my mind and judgment was clouded just because I already had this established relationship with Chick-fil-A. And, and so I think that's key. Uh, do your due diligence for anyone. Yes, great. All right. What are the first three things you do to start your day? <laughs> uh, that's, that's easy. Uh, first thing, I, I, I make sure that I acknowledge like breath of life and, and, and thank God. Second thing I do is make up my bed. That is, that is a, as simple as that sounds, that has been a major win for me. Um, and it's not the act of making up the bed, but it's the act of knowing that I got one task done for the day. So if all else fails, if I'm at work and I get sidetracked from my agenda because I'm putting out multiple fires, at least I, I start my day with a sense of accomplishment of like, you know what, I made up my bed. Then I come in, glass of water, vitamins. Um, I, I may pull out my phone, look at the latest news, whether it's CNN or Wall Street Journal, whatever the case may be. And then I make sure that I pause, spend 15 minutes trying to understand What's going to be the one, the three things that I want to get accomplished today? Because I think that's so important. Um, now, I'm not always the greatest at it. And there are days where I don't follow that, that, that regimen. However, it is the practice and it is the, the true North Star for me that I can go back because I started implementing those daily habits. And it's, it's just as simple as that. And, and what you're doing is you're conditioning your mindset to be disciplined. Awesome. Yes. You're giving us great, some great nuggets here. Um, <laughs> what podcast do you recommend listening to? Wow. Um, so I would say, um, man, it, it's several. Let me, let me pull up my, my podcast here, podcast list. Um, definitely Oprah and her uh, some of her passion podcasts. Um, again, I'm a huge, huge fan of, of TD Jakes. Uh, there are some couple of ones on, on real estate that I listen to. Um, and let, let's see, man, it, it's just so many of them out there. Um, and, and I'll be honest, like people had to encourage me to get into podcasts because I'm, I'm, I'm old school. It's like, I like to look at a book write notes, have something to go back to reference to. Sometimes I think when you get with, with podcasts, at least for how I'm wired, is like I literally have to be concentrated in order to take the message away from them. Um, so I, I, I'll leave you guys with that, but I can follow up with the list of other uh, playlists of, of, of podcasting. Okay, great. And um, we will be doing a survey so I can add that in there. So for those who want to hear or see about the podcast, I can add that in there. Um, how important um, are mentors? The reason why I ask is because we're, like I, we talked earlier, um, mm -hmm. gonna be starting a mentor association for our entrepreneurship students where we will 
pretty much matched them up with a mentor throughout the program. How important is it to have a mentor? Very important. I, again, you talk about those seat planners. Those individuals, whether they're still in life or in life for a particular season, they help navigate and mentor through my entire process. And the reason why mentorship is so important because it's one thing to go to school and learn that the textbook aspect of it, but you need someone who's actually been out there and experienced it and had an opportunity to apply what, what it is that you are learning inside of the classroom. There's nothing like having someone else with an unbiased opinion be able to speak into, hey, man, I, I, I made that mistake. I want you to do it differently. And, and I'm a huge advocate for that um, because it allowed me along my career to avoid so many pitfalls. It, and if I did not have those people as mentors, who knows where I would be today? So it's, it's, it's very important. And the other thing that I would tell you about mentorship, um, T.D. Jake said something along the lines, I'm paraphrasing here, is like, be sure, be methodical and be specific in who you select as your mentorship. Because in order for you to get the most value out of that, there's gonna come a time where you have to be completely vulnerable. It's like going to the doctor and telling them, hey, you need help, but you can't tell them how you're feeling. It doesn't work. And so as you think about going out there looking for a, a mentor, you got to be able to build that relationship. It has to be a person that you can trust. It has to be a person that you feel comfortable with. It has to be a person that you feel you can be vulnerable with and say, hey, I, I just don't know this. I, I can't tell you how many times I picked up the phone call, the phone and, and called some of my mentors and said, I'm lost. Can you help me with this? So very important. Right. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, what are some mistakes that you wish you could have avoided? Mistakes. You know, I am. Um, that's a that's a really good question. I don't know if there are mistakes I wish I could have avoided because if you're intentional about learning from your mistakes, then it will help you just be a better person. It'll help you be a better entrepreneur. It'll help you be a better entrepreneur um, if you're intentional about learning from those mistakes. Have I made mistakes in the past? Absolutely. Um, if, if anything, there would probably be times where, hey, I wish I would have sought more counsel in, in this. I wish I would have listened to my team a little bit more. But I don't know if there are any mistakes that I would say I wish I would have avoided. And, and that's, that's real deep there because, again, you can't, you can't think that you're going to embark upon an entrepreneur journey and be fearful of making mistakes. Some of your best learnings come from making those mistakes. And so that's why I answered the question in a way in which I did of like, I don't know if there is any mistakes that I've made that I, I wish I would have avoided. Do I wish I would have made different mistakes? Eh, yeah. Uh, but I don't know if I would say, man, I, I, I wish I would have avoided that. Because again, I'm very intentional in, in, in trying to learn from those mistakes. Awesome. So if you could just leave us with one last advice, one, just one key sentence or advice that the students can take away with them and keep with them, what, what would it be? Hmm. So several, several words, purpose, mindset, discipline, failures and risk, plan and team. Those words that I just provided for you guys, make sure that you have those as a part of your toolbox. I, I think, again, I've come across so many entrepreneurs that just get caught up on, hey, I got to put together the perfect business plan. I got to put together the perfect financial statements. All of those are true, but you got to have those other words, purpose, mindset, failures and risk and team plan and discipline. All of that has to be a part of your, your, your vernacular, your, your vocabulary. And because 
that's what keeps most entrepreneurs in the game. Um, when I, I just read an article this morning from Entrepreneur, Mag uh, Entrepreneur Magazine talking about uh, the CEO of Instacart. This, this young man, 33, billionaire, started 20, 20 something multiple startups and failed at them before he was able to successfully launch the car. If he did not understand what his purpose was, if he did not, would he be able to say through where, the, where it is today? And, and that would be my encouragement to anyone that's thinking about embarking upon that entrepreneurial journey is no rate of the failures, take those risks, plan, and make sure that you have a really good engaged team around what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Awesome. Brandon, just, I just want to thank you for giving us this amazing glimpse into your entrepreneurship journey. Um, this is our last installment of our series, but we will be back in February with our first guest being um, Jason Weaver. He is, if you remember that name, he is the voice of, uh, the singing voice of, of Simba. So please be on the lookout for the registration for our next speaker series in the spring. Um, I'm so grateful for everyone who attended today. There will be a survey. So I ask that if you could please fill that survey out. Um, it definitely helps us with our other entrepreneurship speaker series. Um, and again, if you guys have questions, you always can reach out to me, which I'll have that information on the survey as well. And I hope that everyone has a Wonderful, wonderful afternoon and a, a great break. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys.